Hey guys, welcome back to this channel and for those who don't know me, my name is April. I'm a Filipina living here in Israel. Since I opened this YouTube channel, I've been getting a lot of questions regarding culture, tradition, and most especially religious differences between me and my husband who is a Jew. So in this video, I'm gonna go over seven most frequently asked questions regarding marrying a Jew. Like how did our wedding look like? Did I convert? What is the religion of our kids? Or do we celebrate Christian or Jewish holidays? So stay tuned if you guys are curious, but before we start, if you've been following this channel for some time and you haven't subscribed yet, please consider hitting that subscribe button. And while you're at it, hit that notification bell button so you'll be updated every time I upload a new video. So let's go over these questions. So first question, how did you, a Christian, marry a Jew? By religious law, Jewish people are not supposed to marry non-Jews unless they convert. But a Christian and a Jew can do a civil wedding and it is accepted by most Western countries. In our case, we were living in Thailand for two years and we got engaged and there goes the discussion of how and where are we gonna get married. We could have done a civil wedding in the Philippines, but Philippines is one of the few countries in the world where divorce is not legal. This is because of the strong influence of Roman Catholic churches, but I feel like there are so many couples who are trapped in an abusive or unhealthy or unwanted relationships without the way of legally ending it. And this lack of security can be especially daunting to foreigners who may feel like there's a lack of um, exit strategy if the relationship becomes unhealthy or abusive. and. Me and Tomer shared the same opinion in that matter. So we did a civil wedding in Bangkok. And after that, of course, we reported the marriage to both of the consulates of Philippines and Israel. So then our marriage was, of course, um, legal in both countries. And then a few months later, we moved to the Philippines where we did a symbolic wedding. I call it a symbolic wedding because in that time, we were actually already married on paper, but we wanted to do a symbolic ceremony around our friends and families. So the wedding was actually officiated by a Filipino guy, but this guy was the most Jewish Filipino guy we know in Cebu who really attends to um, Shabbat or Friday gatherings in Chabad or Jewish community center. and because obviously a real rabbi cannot cannot marry us so we had a wedding that blends christian and jewish wedding tradition question number two did you convert what is the kids religion so according to traditional jewish law a person's jewish status is passed through the mother so children are jewish if born to a jewish mom Otherwise, a ritual of a Jewish conversion is necessary and if one really wants to be one, that can be a very long road to take. So I did not convert, I did not intend to, and Tomer never asked me to. With our kids, we decided to expose them to both Christianity and Judaism and we want them to make their own choices when it comes to their religious identity when they are older. I mean as as they grow older they can decide which religion if any resonates with them personally. But since we live here in Israel our kids follow Judaism more closely but there is still some exposure of Christianity's beliefs and practices. So we're okay with putting up Christmas tree for Christmas, but at the same time, we also celebrate Jewish holidays like, pa like Passover and Hanukkah. And since our kids go to school where they get exposure to a lot of Jewish customs and tradition, I feel like my kids have a stronger sense of Jewish identity, which I think is pretty normal. Question number three, do you celebrate Jewish holidays? Um, Tomer is a secular Jew and even before he met me, he celebrated Jewish holidays in a more 
secular or cultural way. It was more it was more about social or traditional aspect rather than the religious aspect of it. So in our family we still celebrate Jewish traditions and customs like we light candles for the Hanukkah and we do the Passover setters but there are a lot of Jewish holidays that we don't do that we don't really observe like some people on Yom Kippur which was which is like the holiest holidays for Judaism some most people some people really fast they don't eat but for us we don't observe that but rather we do it in like the more traditional way which is like taking the kids kids out in the road because in that day there are no cars allowed to drive for the full day so everybody just take their kids out with their bicycle and just for the whole day be on the road trips like that so we celebrate it in a more cultural way other than the religious aspect of it question number four what language do you speak at home and how do you handle the language barrier we adopted the one person one language method in raising our children and with this method each parent consistently speaks only one of the two languages to the child so in our case i only speak to them in english and tomer only speaks to them in hebrew i am a native bisaya speaker which is one of the many dialects in the philippines but i feel like speaking to them in english will give them an advantage in the future especially that children in their school system here are not being exposed to english since hebrew is the medium of teaching here in school and children are only exposed to english in school in the later years of the primary level but i can tell that my kids hebrew is so much um, so much stronger than their english because Obviously, they go to a Hebrew-speaking school and when they go out, it's a Hebrew-speaking community. So it's just natural that way that their Hebrew is going to be much stronger than their English. So in the beginning, they do a lot of mixed languages where they respond with mix of English and Hebrew. But later on, it's like a code switching where they automatically switch to Hebrew when they're talking to their, to their dad and they automatically switch to English when they're having a com uh, conversation with me and that is a very impressive skill. Question number five. How do you adapt to Jewish dietary laws? Um, observance to Jewish dietary practices really varies. Some Jews really adhere strictly to kosher diet which is mainly no pork, no shell food and they cannot eat meat and dairy products together. But others have a more relaxed approach to eating these foods. In our case, Tomer has a more um, flexible approach. I mean, he has eaten pork and shell foods in the past, especially when he lived outside Israel, but he would still prefer not to eat those kind of food. Not because of Jewish law when it comes to food, but it's more like a personal choice. I feel like he didn't grow up eating those kind of foods, so he's just not used to eating them. The way I see it, say, I am not accustomed to eating those exotic food like frogs or snails or bugs, which I know in some other parts of the world are being eaten and it's normal for them. So maybe yes, I can try them, but I prefer not to. So for us, we are not strict at all when it comes to food, when it comes to observing the kosher diet. Say we sit in a restaurant, Tomer won't mind if I order something that comes with pork or shell food or maybe a burger that has a cheese on it. Um, Tomer doesn't mind if I eat those in front of him. He actually don't even mind if I cook them in our home, but he just won't eat it. So why should I make something that I know he won't eat, right? And there's so many other dishes I can cook that both of us are happy to eat. So I'd rather serve something on the table that both of us can eat. Question number six. How does the threat of war affect our daily life in Israel? 
Um, yes, there is always a threat of war in Israel because of its geopolitical situation or the ongoing conflicts in the region. It is very common to see an IDF soldier carrying guns in public places, usually a rifle. This has become a very common sight for me. In the beginning, I was like, wow, like so many people are carrying like big rifles in the road in the public places. Military service is mandatory in Israel for both men and women, typically at the age of 18. And it's three years for men and two years for women. And they really put a strong emphasis on emergency preparedness. Like in this building where we live right now, every unit has its own bomb shelter rooms, which is commonly known as mamad in Hebrew. It looks like a normal room. In fact, Tomer is using it as his home office. But these bomb shelter rooms are reinforced rooms constructed with very thick concrete walls and ceilings that can withstand explosions. And the door is made of reinforced steel or heavy duty materials. So, so for me, I feel generally safe here in Israel. But of course, we try to avoid going to places that has increased risk of attacks. Question number seven. This is the last one, guys. Are there any challenges related to immigration or residency? Once you have been married to an Israeli citizen and have resided in Israel for a specific period of time, you may be eligible to apply for an Israeli citizenship. So in our case, it wasn't an easy beginning. When we moved here, I flew here as a tourist. So I got in here, but I had to flew out of the country after three months, after my tourist visa expired because they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't allow me to stay any longer, even though I was already married to Tomer. So I had to go back to the Philippines. Tomer had to open a request to the Interior Ministry to start the gradual five years process to obtain citizenship on the basis of our relationship. And here we are, five years later, I'm still waiting for, for that citizenship. But at least, finally, we are in the last step. Uh, so it has some set of requirements, like you need to set your center of life to be here in Israel. And you cannot live outside Israel for many months. But even before becoming a resident, you can get a temporary resident status where you get the rights and benefits, including healthcare or job opportunities. But yeah, the road we took was very long, complex, and gave us a lot of headache. But with the right patience and proper documents, we are finally in the last step. And hopefully, before the year ends, I will have it. So that's it guys, hopefully I answered all your questions about marrying a Jew and if you guys have more questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and I will try my best to answer them. And if you guys love this video, please hit that like button, subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell button so you guys will be updated every time I upload a video and I always try my best to upload every Sunday. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!